using, and then we'll start. So we'll keep this up for just a minute. Hello, everyone. My name is Darby Jones from EFX for America, and I have the pleasure of overseeing our educational partnerships around the country. I want to welcome all of you, teachers and students and EF staff members from around the country and around the world to this truly unique and special opportunity to hear from two survivors of the attacks on September 11th, 2001, exactly 20 years ago tomorrow. This is only possible through an incredible partnership we have with the 9-11 Tribute Museum that has already afforded thousands of students who are traveling with EF to meet survivors and first responders on their educational trips while visiting New York and be profoundly impacted by their powerful stories of survival. I want to soon turn this over to my friend, Quaker Farrar, who is amazing to work with and serves as the Tribute Museum's volunteer program and outreach manager. He will give a bit more insight into the 9-11 Tribute Museum itself and introduce our guests, Desiree and Jeanette. We are so honored and grateful that they are here with us today to courageously share their stories. If you haven't already done so, please switch from gallery view to speaker view and we would love if you have questions to type them into the Q&A or into the chat and we will try and get to them at the end, time permitting. My wonderful colleague, Sarah Shaben, will monitor the chat and facilitate the latter portion of today's program. So with that said, welcome, Kweku and guests, and over to you. And thank you so much, Darby. And thank you all for joining us this morning. As Darby mentioned, my name is Kwaku Farrar, and I oversee our outreach, our volunteer program, among other things, at the 9-11 Tribute Museum. Um, the 9-11 Tribute Museum, not to be confused with the 9-11 Memorial Museum, is actually the first 9-11 museum created by the September 11th Families Association in 2006. Um, Tribute was really created to share the personal stories of those personally impacted by 9-11. So these are family members who lost loved ones, survivors, first responders, recovery workers, as well as residents who were displaced by the attacks. Um, at our museum, we have artifacts, but really <clears throat> the core of our museum are the people who share their personal stories in the museum and on our tours. Um, so this morning, you'll be hearing two personal stories from Jeanette Gutierrez and Desiree Boucher. Um, They're both 9-11 survivors. As Darby mentioned, please, if you have any questions for them, put them in the chat and Sarah will be sure to get those over to them. So without any further ado, I'll give the floor up to Desiree to share her story. Desiree. Thank you, Kwaku. And welcome everybody. And thank you for joining us and allowing Jeanette and I to tell our stories because we need to tell our stories. And because many of you uh, were not even born 20 years ago, um, I'd like to start with sort of a timeline of events. And I want to start by saying that that day was beautiful. It was a beautiful blue sky. There were no clouds uh, in the sky. In fact, pilots have a phrase for it. They call it severe clear. On that morning, American Flight 11 was fully fueled. It was bound for Los Angeles. It left Boston Logan Airport. We know it was hijacked. That plane came back into the New York City uh, fly zone 
and struck the North Tower at 846 that morning. Now, when that plane went into that building, it went into what we consider the core of the building and went straight in. It entered in at the 93rd to 99th floors and compromised all three stairwells. So if you were above the 92nd floor, there was no escape because there were no stairs to come down. Approximately 15 minutes later, United Flight 175 also fully fueled, also bound for Los Angeles, also left Boston Logan Airport. We know it was hijacked. It too came down into the New York City area, flew past the World Trade Center, went over the Statue of Liberty out in the harbor, made a sharp turn and came back down and crashed into the south side of the South Tower. And when that plane went into the building, it actually went in at an angle allowing one stairwell open. So if you were above impact zone, could make it out of the, um, and could find the stairwell and make it out of the building, uh, you made it out okay. And I believe there were about 18 people who did make it, found that one stairwell and made it out of the building that morning. There were two other flights that morning. American Flight 77 was also fully fueled. It too was bound for Los Angeles that left, um, left Dulles Airport in Washington, DC. We know it was hijacked, came back into the Washington DC area, crashing into the Pentagon, killing 100 and 184 people at the Pentagon. And the final flight that day was United 93. It too was fully fueled. It was bound for San Francisco. Um, Slightly different scenario with this plane because it was held uh, on the tarmac and only took off a couple of minutes before American Flight 11 crashed into the North Tower, but it did take off. We know it was hijacked and the passengers and crew were on cell phones and air phones. They knew what was happening here in, in New York as well as in Washington, DC. And they took it upon themselves to storm that cockpit and that plane came down in Somerset County, Pennsylvania near Shanksville, killing all 40 on board. So let me tell you a little bit about my story. As Quaco said, I am a survivor. I worked in um, the South Tower, Tower Two, and I worked on the 101st floor. Now certain things were happening in New York City that day that helped save lives. One being it was the first day of public school. So what a lot of parents, especially with kindergartners, our first graders do, they take the day off and they escort their children to school and they take that first day photo that I'm sure is in all your family albums. And so parents would not have been there. If they had a child and took the day of the morning off, they would not have been at the Trade Center that morning. It was also a first day, uh, not first day, it was a um, elective day. It was a primary election. Mayor Rudolph Giuliani's last day in office would have been December 31st. So we were having an election, New York City was having an election to see who would be on the ballot. And what most companies do is allow their employees to go vote first so that their day isn't interrupted. So people may have been out voting that morning. I also think what helped save lives on September 11th is that most companies begin work at 9 a.m. And when that first plane hit at 8.46, uh, security was no longer allowing people into the building. So if you're a person who likes to slide into their seat at the very last minute, you probably would not have been in the building that morning. As I said, I'm a survivor. I worked on the 101st floor of the South Tower and I start at 8.30. So I had no choice but to be at work at 8.30. And at 8.46, when that first plane entered into the North Tower, I was as far away as you could be um, and I heard boom. It was just a very faint boom. What was distressing was that I was working on a PowerPoint presentation, the lights went off, the computer went off. I did not hit save. You know what happens when you don't hit the save button, but everything came right back on. And we thought, okay, a transformer in lower Manhattan must have blown. And that's why the lights went off and came right back on until you looked outside. And what had been a beautiful, beautiful blue sky was now turning brown. And there's paper swirling outside our window. I'm on the 101st floor. Paper should not be swirling outside my window. My telephone rang. I went into my office to answer it. And a friend of mine at Seven World Trade called. And she says, are you OK? And I said, yes, why? And she said that she had just learned that a bomb had gone off. 
Now, a bomb had gone off in 1993 at the Trade Center. So there was a likelihood that we thought that could have happened. I called out to my coworkers that I had just learned a bomb had gone off. And I went back into my office to make a phone call. I had to call my mother. I knew that if she heard about these events and I didn't report in, I was gonna be in trouble. And it's my mother who said, are you leaving? And I said, yes, I would. Now I live out in New Jersey, I don't live in New York. So I needed to pack my bag. I needed my train tickets to get me back home. I needed my book to read because public transportation, you have to bring some sort of reading material. And after I'd finished packing my bag, I looked up and I noticed Jim, our office manager walking past. And he had, said, he had heard me say earlier that a bomb had gone off and he told us that his wife had just called him. She had been watching the news and a plane had gone into the North Tower. And that made sense to us. When you work on the 101st floor of one of these buildings, planes flew below us, helicopters flew below us. We just thought it was pilot fatality or mechanical difficulty, and that's why that plane crashed into the building. I looked back up and uh, after finishing packing my bag and Jim was walking past again with a couple of my coworkers and I joined them and we walked around three quarters of the floor. Now, each of these floors was one acre large and we went from the south side to the west side to the north side. And we went up to the window and we looked out and we looked up, down and around. We didn't see anything, but we didn't know what we should be looking for. And it was at that point, Jim said, time to go home. And we thought, this is great. It's not even 9 a.m. and we're headed downstairs for a cup of coffee or a cup of tea and we'll come up when we get the all clear. I do remember one thing though, as we walked around that floor, there was nobody on the floor. And I said to some of my coworkers later, where were you? Did you, were you out voting? Did you take the day off? What happened? And my coworkers who sat on the west side and the north side of the building said that they felt the heat of the airplane parts as they went past their windows. Papers on their desk became charred. They got up and immediately evacuated. And those of us who sat on the south and east side of the building didn't even know what was going on. But Jim said, time to go. And I headed towards the elevators and I watched Jim go down the corridor. He was doing another sweep. He wanted to make sure everybody knew that it was time to leave. Jim did not make it out. The way each of these two 110 story buildings were constructed they had elevators in them and they used the elevators as subways. So that morning I would have come into the lower lobby, taken the 78th floor express elevator. So it went direct to the 78th floor. It was huge, it held about 55 people. And at the 78th floor sky lobby, I exited and took a local elevator up to the 101st floor. So that morning I'm on 101, quickly made it down to the 78th floor sky lobby and it was packed with people. They guesstimate at least 400 people were waiting for the elevator to take them to the lower lobby. And it was noisy and loud and people were trying to make cell phone calls. Now, cell phones didn't work that day, but people kept trying to make them. The one thing I did not feel was panic. Everything that was happening was happening in the other building in the North Tower. Our building was safe and secure. In fact, I've been asked, did I hear the announcements that were being done over the PA system that our building was safe and secure and that we should return to our offices? I didn't hear those announcements. I do know I made it, I made it onto one of the last elevators uh, that made it down to the lower lobby level. And when I got down there, it would have been so easy to go out onto the street level, onto Liberty Street, except that the police and the fire department were there. And because there were fires going on across the street for our safety, they asked us to find another way out. So I went down one level to the mall and we came, I was with three of my coworkers. We came up again onto Liberty Street. And it, when we looked down, it was nothing but covered with letters and envelopes, UPS, FedEx, DHL. And it kind of reinforced in my mind that it must've been a mail plane that didn't quite make it to Newark Airport and crashed into the building, a little pup pup plane. We took about 10 steps when my coworker Ingrid yelled run. 
And to this day, she's not sure why she said it, but I can tell you the time was 9.03. At 9.03 is when United 175 crashed into our building. And again, it entered into the 77th to 85th floor. And I had just left 400 people on the 78th floor sky lobby. I also told you earlier, only about 18 people found that one stairwell, which led them to safety. Here at the World Trade Center, 2,749 people died, 176 from my company and 19 from my floor. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Jeanette to tell you her story. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> um, as, as you know, I am also a 9-11 survivor. My story is very different from Desiree's and actually all our stories are very different. Nobody has the same story, right? And at 8.46 a.m., when the first plane hit, I was sitting at my desk in a building across the street from One World Trade. So I wasn't in any of the towers. I was in a building directly across from One World Trade. And I heard and I felt the first plane hit, but I didn't know it was a plane. And you hear strange things in the city all the time. So I really paid no mind until I saw something, not sure what to this day, past the window. Um, and it was big. And I thought, well, what could that be? And that's when I became a nosy New Yorker and I pressed my face against the window and I looked up to see where it had come from, what it was. And I saw what everybody sees now, a big hole with black smoke coming out of it and uh, flames. And I thought something really bad is going on up there. No idea what it was. Called my older sister who worked downtown in the area, but not in the direct immediate area. She worked for the government and I just figured she would know more than I knew. And I told her, she called me back quickly and reported that it was a small plane, like Desiree said, a little cut of plane. And I thought that that's kind of weird because the sky was blue. I don't understand how the, the pilot didn't see the World Trade Center. And I wasn't crying, but I was upset. I knew there were people dead across the street and hurt. Nothing I could do about it, and I went back to work. 17 minutes later, when the South Tower struck, I didn't even know. I didn't hear it, I didn't, nothing. I was just working. And my sister called me and said, two World Trade just got hit, you gotta go. She was not, she was not upset, she was not anxious, she wasn't demanding, she was very calm. She did not say we're under attack. She did not tell me what was going on because she knows I'm a chicken and it would have made me freeze. So she said, we should leave. And I didn't want to. The people over the PA said, stay where you are. You are safer inside. I like that idea, but my sister did not. And to get me out, she said, why don't you just meet me and we'll leave together. And that made sense. Um, I left the building and when I did, that's when I saw like a bunch of people hanging out in my lobby and some of them had blood on them, some of them had stuff on them. And I thought, I thought like everything was happening up above in the sky, like high in the building. And I realized it was people downstairs that were down where I was going to be, were in danger. And I was a little afraid just of getting hurt, not, not getting killed. And Eventually, I met up with my sister, um, and by then, I kind of had an idea what was going on, but not a full idea, and I think now I know why, because I was protecting myself from the horror of what was going on that day, uh, but eventually, it did sink in that somebody really was trying to kill me, and I'm like, well, I'm not anybody. I'm just me. I don't understand why this would happen, and uh, thankfully, my sister did not let me... Uh, dawdle. She's like, we got to go. and We got to go now. We left and we're far from the downtown area when the towers collapsed at 9.59 and 10.28. <laughs> Thank you, Desiree. Um, we, we didn't experience that terror. We didn't run like Desiree. It was, it was the 
probably the best scenario you could get to be a survivor, right? Um, for me, later that night when I got home, eventually, safely, um, I watched TV and I thought, like, how do people, the firefighters, the police, the EMT, everybody was helping everybody else. And um, I couldn't imagine what it was like what it's like to put my life on the line to help somebody else. I mean, we know the military and the police and the firefighters, they, they do that. That's what they sign up for, right? But people like Jim, people like my sister who, who walk towards who walk towards what everybody else is running away from. Why do they do that? I don't know, I'm not one of those people. I am really happy my sister is because if I would have stayed in the building, I probably would have been killed. If I would have stayed longer than I did, I probably would have been killed. And if I would have agreed to my, my sister with my sister to leave later than I did, she would have been coming towards what everybody was a, running away from. And maybe she would have been killed, but we weren't. And so I don't know the answer to why people do it, but I do know that not all the heroes wear uniforms. Sometimes they're just your big sister. And I, I will of course be grateful for that forever. Um, after 9-11, I didn't think about it. I didn't talk about it with my sister ever. And then in 2010, I got a new job and I ended up back downtown. Because after 9-11, my building that I was in was heavily damaged and my company moved midtown and we never moved back. 2010, I got a new job and I heard a, a tour going through my building, the lobby of my building about 9-11 and Ground Zero. And I was interested in learning about it. And so I signed up for a tour with the 9-11 Tribute Museum. And my tour guide was none other than Desiree. And she told her story much like she did today in a little more detail. She, I was a hot mess uh, listening to it. And to be fair, she was crying too. Uh, but I thought to myself, why does she do this? She's not. And after the tour was over, I said, well, I don't, know, I don't understand why you even do this. And she explained how it's helpful for her uh, to, to tell her story and how it honors Jim. And I still thought she was crazy. And she, I told her, you know, that I was a 9-11 survivor and she encouraged me to do the same, to be a tour guide. And I did, I did. And it absolutely changed my life completely. It allowed me to let go of all this, all the feelings that I had that I bottled up for the last nine years. It introduced me to other people like Desiree, other people like me, uh, survivors, first responders, family members, people who get 9-11 on a level on a level that we experienced it. So I didn't feel so alone. And it also um, allowed me to honor my sister uh, because she is a hero. And when you speak, when you speak about what happens to you, whether it's good or bad, you, you share your story and you share the story of the people you're talking about. And it's really, really, really important. And you can't do that unless somebody's listening. So thank you for listening. Thank you both for telling your story. It is so um, special and unique for us to be able to hear firsthand how these events impacted you and exactly what you guys um, went through. And I'm grateful through the Tribute Museum, you have this opportunity. Uh, Jeanette, like you said, it is a bit of therapy in a way, finding other people who went through something similar to you. So. Um, thank you so much for sharing and being a part of this. I wanna to say to everyone who's on the call, if you have questions, please put them in the, the q and I'm happy to ask um, them. We have a few minutes left here. Um, I do wanna start with one question. Um, you know, Jeanette, you mentioned how it, nice it is to be able to be within the Tribute Museum and kind of have a chance to connect with other people like Desiree and those who went through this with you. And I'm curious how the both of you feel and now it's like, the 20th anniversary 20 years ago and you know so many people like we mentioned on this call weren't even alive then you know what is it like as we get further and further away from this event but it is just something that was so 
important, you know, in your lives? How is it changing? How does that, does it change the way you feel about telling your story now that we're getting towards this point? Uh, I can only speak for myself, but it's, it's not 20 years for me. It's every day for me. It doesn't, I feel, I feel the same way I felt 20 years ago. I'm still horrified by, by what happened. I can never forget it. Uh, what has changed is that I'm closer to Desiree today than I was 20 years ago or 10 years ago, right? Because I only know you 10 years or 11 years, right? The friendships that I've made with the people at Tribute um, have grown deeper. And now some, some of them are family to me. Like they know my whole family, not just me. They're my friends and my family. But when people say, well, it's been 20 years, it's every day for us. 10 years, one year, uh, seven years, it's, it's it doesn't change, it doesn't change. And uh, it, the only thing that changes for me is the time of year. In August, I start to get a knot in my stomach, but every August, the knot is not any tighter or looser today, the day before. It's the same as it was every year. Uh, the other thing that has changed um, is that the people we speak to now are people who have no memory of it. And it makes it more important for me to tell my story. Because when I'm gone, somebody has to continue. What do you think, that, Desiree? Yeah, I, I agree with that. And I think the media concentrates on the milestone anniversaries. Um, but every year is just as difficult. And as Jeanette said, every day is. And it is important that we tell our story. It's important that we get it out of our systems. But it's important that people listen. So we are very grateful for this opportunity. We're grateful to be able to hear it. Thank you. Um, someone had a question in the chat that you guys both mentioned similarly, like at first you didn't really understand what was happening um, you know, at a large scale. When exactly did you finally realize or figure out that it was a terrorist attack um, on US soil? For me, it was probably that evening um, when I got in front of a TV uh, and actually saw the events. I mean, we were there, but when you were there on site, you didn't know what was going on. You just had absolutely no idea. So it was probably that evening when it was, you know, when I heard the president talking. Right, that's exactly it. Like I didn't get in front of a TV for hours. So when the Pentagon was hit, when the plane went down to Chanksville, even when the tower was collapsed, I didn't know. I didn't know. A third of the world was watching. I wasn't part of that third. I, I didn't know. So, um, I guess I was lucky, not I guess, I was definitely lucky not to have to have that knowledge at the minute that it was happening, that I, I watched it later. Uh, but it was late, much later that night when I got home and put on the TV and watched and listened to what everybody was saying had happened. Because from what I understand from people who were watching, people were saying what they thought happened, the newscasters. It wasn't like definitely confirmed until when I got home and yes, the two towers did collapse. Yes, it was on purpose. Yes, we were a target. And knowing it and understanding it are two different things. I didn't quite understand it. Not at that point. Thank you. Um, another question that came up, do you both feel as though you, you live life differently having gone through something like this now? And how so maybe? Go ahead, Jeanette. Yeah. You're, you're bursting. You want to test. Yeah. <laughs> well, life is so different. Yeah. Um, that some parts not not so cool, different. Like I'm afraid of planes when I when I'm not near an airport, or even when I'm near an airport, I still have some kind of like, oh my God. Uh, just recently I was on the 9-11 Plaza with two friends showing them around, you know, I'm a tour guide. And I didn't, I hadn't been in the city in a while and I didn't realize the plaza closes at four or five o'clock, whatever time it was. And security was like telling us to leave. And I'm like, we gotta go, we gotta go. There's something wrong, we gotta go. That's not normal, <laughs> but that is normal for me. That's, that's my life now, right? The other part is I have met the most amazing people and have had the most fabulous experiences um, because of 9-11. 
and I hope that I have helped some people um, with my experience going through this tragedy and, and have shown them that there is, there's goodness, there's still goodness everywhere, everywhere. Even though we saw the bad that day, there's goodness everywhere. I, I totally agree, Jeanette. Live life to the fullest is the best that you can do. Amazing. Um, two more, I know we're right at time, but uh, just two more questions for you. One, just a little a logistic question that came up. So, uh, people are wondering, you know, it was in such chaos that day. How did each of you actually get home uh, that morning? Were you, were you able to get home the normal way? Everything shut down in the city um, almost immediately. But I think by nine o'clock, the subways had started to shut down. Bridges were beginning to shut down, certainly after the second attack. The only way off of the island was, you know, to walk off on, off a bridge, walk off on a bridge, not walk off a bridge. Um, I did not get home that evening. I actually walked to Midtown and I stayed with a friend uh, and when the subway started running again, I wound up in Queens. So I didn't go home until the next day. Jeanette, how did you make out? I think that's the first time I heard that, that's right. I didn't know that. I got home later that night. I, I live on an island. I live on Staten Island. So island to island was almost impossible. But that night, my sister and I decided to try to get some kind of bus to take us at least to Brooklyn which is across from Manhattan and where we were both raised. So we knew lots of people there that we could stay with. And we found a bus that was going to Staten Island. So it took us a long time, but we both got home and I slept in my bed that night. Amazing. So just one more question before we wrap up. Um, I'm curious um, what you guys think, and, and we mentioned, you know, it's, there's so many young people now that weren't around when this happened. You know, what do you think is the most, important thing that you would like young people to take away or to know about um, what happened that day? What would you like them to remember? Well, um, I think Jeanette said it very nicely. You know, a lot of bad happened that day. And, um, but we have to think about what happened after. People helping people, we were very resilient. Um, there was a lot of compassion. The country was brought together. Um, you have to look at the good of it. Um, from all the bad, you have to find some good. That's exactly it. The unity we felt after 9-11, it's, it's gone. And between COVID and being vaccinated, not being vaccinated and politics and everybody's split in things. If, if you just kind, just kind, be kind period, whether you believe in the same thing or not, that, that day when you watch TV and you saw, you know, all different kinds of people from different backgrounds, different religions, helping each other and not asking, just doing it, just be kind and pay it forward. You know, um, both of us are here because somebody, somebody said something that made us do something and that was leave. And that's, that's a simple kindness, leave so you don't get hurt. And if, if, we could, if we could just, it's so simple, it's such a simple message, but we have to do it, just be kind. It's a simple message, but it's fun. Thank you both so much. Um, I cannot tell you how much we appreciate and are grateful for this time with you and, and you giving us your stories and your perspective. It is really special. and really impactful for, for all of us. So thank you so much for being here. Um, I'll turn it back to you, Darby, to see if there's anything else you wanna say before we wrap up. Sure, um, no, just the biggest thank you to, to Desiree, Jeanette and Kwaku. You have helped make this commemoration really come alive for all of us and have given a voice to those who, who just no longer have one. So thank you to everyone at home and in classrooms around the country for joining. The survey will pop up at the end of the presentation, so please take a moment to give us uh, your feedback. But thank you again with all of our hearts. Have a good day. Thank you Bye all everyone. for joining. Thank you. Thanks.